Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for the delay. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is uh, the first uh, 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 Zaremski Forum of the 2021-2022 uh, academic year. Um, the uh, Zaremski Forums are endowed by a uh, alum of the law school, uh, Miles Zaremski, and his wife, Elena, and we're very grateful to them for endowing these uh, forums. And um, our guest today uh, is Vince Agnelli. He is an attorney with CareSource, which is a prominent managed care plan uh, uh, specializing in Medicaid managed care. Uh, you may know that um, in Ohio, 80% uh, of Medicaid services are provided uh, by managed care plans, and um, uh, CareSource is uh, the is the, uh, by far the most, uh, 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 the most prominent, the largest uh, Medicaid plan. Um, uh, Vince is, part, uh, is an attorney with CareSource's Office of the General Counsel. He focuses on providing legal advice on health insurance law and regulatory compliance. And the topic of his talk today is the role of managed care in today's healthcare system. Um, there will be box lunches available for those of you here in person afterwards. They're out behind. Um, and um, uh, Patty Harbold will be posting an activity code in the chat uh, for, on Zoom for those of you who want to get uh, continuing legal education credit. And without more, please welcome Vince Daniele. Thank you. You can hear me? All right, excellent. I uh, first want to thank uh, Case Western for having me here to speak. It's an honor and, uh, and a privilege to be able to come back and speak to uh, young legal minds. I was in your shoes about 12 years ago, so um, thank you for having me. The, um, the intersection of law and health care couldn't be more apparent in our, in our health system. Everyone here has likely seen a doctor before, correct? <laughs> yes. I would think so. Um, you've also probably dealt with health insurance at some point, correct? Okay. You know, when I, was, when I was a kid growing up, I wanted to be one of three things. A doctor, a lawyer, or a fighter pilot. <laughs> now, I wanted to be a fighter pilot because of Top Gun, but, you know, I didn't make it that way. Um, how, however, being a healthcare lawyer allows me to practice law uh, but also interact with medical policy, medical directors, um, and patients. And, and for me, it's a great intersection between law and medicine. But the other reason um, that I enjoy what I do here is, is what interests me the most is it's all about people, right? That's, that's what it's most about. It's about people, it's about lives, it's about health. Um, and, to be able to practice law in the healthcare setting, it's a very tangible sort of experience um, to be able to see you impacting lives. So I know that you know, health is like, like air, right? When you're breathing it and, it's, and it's, everything's normal, you don't even notice it. But when your health is impacted, you start to suffer and you see, you see a difference. Um, so I know that the legal work I'm doing um, helps um, make a difference in people's lives, and it's something you can tangibly see. So, for those of you interested in healthcare law, I, it's, a, it's an area I highly encourage. Oh. All right, we got the slides working. There we go. So, We've got four, four topics today um, that I wanted to cover. First, you know, what is managed care? What do we mean by this? What, what don't we mean by this? And um, what is it solving for? The second, why is it important? You know, why is it important in today's healthcare system? Insurers have a unique view in that they see the member's experience across all sorts of different providers, whereas providers see the member or the patient come in only in their office setting. So insurers have a very unique view um, that gives us insight across all systems. And um, I have some insight to share on that as to why it's important. Third, how does managed care work? 
what are important aspects to know, um, how, how do managed care organizations administer um, and deliver health care. So I'll, I'll provide you with some basics. Um, this is a very in-depth area, so there's not enough time. To, uh, this could be a whole semester course, but uh, I'll try to condense as much as I can in 30 minutes. And last, what's the future landscape and focus of, of managed care and health care in general? So those are the four topics uh, we will talk about today. So I think, I think it's best defined or easiest to define by discussing what managed care is not. Back, in, back about 25, 30 years ago, managed care wasn't really a thing. There was, it was more of a, um, it was something called fee for service, which is basically when the state pays providers a specific fee based on a fee schedule that's already been determined and they pay each provider for each test, each procedure, anything that's done. It's on a per payment per service basis. So, you know, a doctor orders a specific test, a visit, procedure gets paid. So there's some potential issues that came up with this. The first is that it incentivizes um, a large volume of services, right? Because if I want to be, if I'm a provider and I want to be paid more, I want to order more tests, I want to order it more services, this increases healthcare costs. That's the first issue. Second, state Medicaid payment rates are oftentimes lower than private insurers are paying them. So this causes um, a, a disparate impact to access of care issues, right? If, if I'm a doctor and I'm being paid more by an insurance plan or somewhere else, compared to serving state Medicaid clients, maybe I don't really want to see or participate in serving these people. Therefore, it created another disincentive to accessing appropriate care, both primary care physicians and also specialists. So essentially, lower fees impact what it, whether providers are willing to participate or not. And this caused problems. So one of the solutions is managed care. So what is managed care? First, let's start with what a managed care organization is, right? It's a broad term that basically describes a plan that delivers health care by controlling the services um, through a couple of, different, couple of different ways. Sorry, can you guys all hear me okay? Okay. Uh, first, it establishes and limits a number of providers within its network. So we've now refined the providers across the state to a particular group of providers who are willing to participate and contract with a health plan. Second, it negotiates the cost of services. So tests, procedures, office visits, anything has been already negotiated with an insurer and a provider. Typically these rates are better rates than, than what you would be able to get in Medicaid uh, fee schedules on a fee-for-service basis. Um, and third, and, and probably the most important, and we'll talk about this, is MCOs, managed care organizations, perform utilization review. It's almost like a first line of defense, so to speak, and I'll, I'll get more into that later. But the two predominant types of MCOs that you're gonna see or that you're familiar with like I'm too loud. Yes? Is this, is this good? Okay. For those of you on the internet, sorry for blasting your ears. Um, the, two, the two types of MCOs that you typically are familiar with or that you hear about the most are health maintenance organizations, HMOs, and PPOs, which are preferred provider organizations. Um, HMOs are typically a little bit more limited in network, you're, you're supposed to stay within the scope of the network, whereas PPOs have a network basis of providers, but do allow you to go out of network at times. Um, but I want to speak a little bit about the difference between fee-for-service and benefits of Medicaid managed care are a couple, right? First, 
and foremost for the state, these are state funds, it, fix, it fixes the cost of, of medical spending um, in its budget. It's a lot more predictable, right? And so instead of the state paying directly all the different patients and services and doctor tests and orders that are given, they pay a set rate, their fixed costs are, are, are fixed, they're capped, right? So that's great for budget predictability. Second, it improves access to care. Now how does it improve access to care? Well, first, they, there's mandated regulate, and we'll get into this a little bit, there's mandated regulations and um, coverage requirements that in order to participate as a state Medicaid provider, you must um, comply with. So you need to have um, coverage within certain vicinities and mileage requirements so that patients, I'm sorry, patients are able to seek appropriate care. And third, it's designed to improve the quality of the care that's provided. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what these are, but basically that's the dichotomy between fee-for-service and managed care. And, and that's what it's trying to solve for. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit more in depth. So how do MCOs help? Um, the first two up there are, lo they lower costs and they have provider relationships. I would consider these to be more financially, economically driven sort of factors. So they lower costs first through, you know, like any, any, any governmental program or entity um, that privatizes their systems and administration. Think of defense contracting, right? The government contracts out. Um, Privatization of government function helps produce and improve effectiveness and efficiency, just like the military spending, for instance. So lower costs naturally come about through business efficiencies, and that's helpful, obviously, when you're trying to protect your spending. Two, the provider relationships are extremely crucial here. Building an adequate network of providers willing to participate incentivizes, one, the providers to provide better quality of care because they want to participate in your plan. Two, it allows for a greater coverage area across the state because now they're able to sort of, um, they're, they're able to participate in a way where maybe before they weren't um, getting as much attraction of, of patients to them because they're now part of a network. So there's a little bit more, a little more power, notoriety, so to speak. The provider relationships also have, have higher, they provide for higher quality of care because now there's a, a contractual relationship between the MCO and the doctors, right? They need to sustain and, and, and provide their obligations under contract to provide certain levels of care. There's more oversight. The other three ways MCOs help are up there. They're, they're broad support, wraparound services, and individualized care. What do I mean by this? So, <clears throat> uh, MCOs take more of a holistic approach to healthcare. Um, it supports not just testing one medical condition, but having broad support and coverage across the spectrum for somebody. If I come in with just a heart attack or some heart condition or, or skin condition, you get treated and you're gone. But this takes a more comprehensive, holistic approach. Um, it also allows for a broad support of services. Um, there's a lot of it's not just about treating the medical condition, it's about treating the person. And then it also allows individualized care. It ensures quality through initially the primary care physician who's sort of the intake manager and then distributes out to specialists. And, and, and here's where primary care physicians, in my opinion, are, are some of the most important people, right, on the front lines. They need to be very intelligent in what they do and very experienced because they're the ones directing patient care to specific specialists to diagnoses and, and other things of that nature. So they're ever more important. But essentially, MCOs take the whole package. They don't just look at treating a condition, right? 
It's a holistic approach. And it's better for the patient. All right. So why is it important? Why is this important? Why is this topic important? Why are MCOs important? So as you can see on, on the slides here, um, spending in healthcare spending in the United States and, and probably throughout the world, but in the United States, it's massive. So you can see it's $613 billion in Medicaid a year in 2009. This is CMS data. Medicare spending almost $800 billion, private insurance. Basically, the total national health spending is $3.8 trillion a year. That's about from those statistics, that's about 20% of our gross domestic product. That is massive. And it's only projected over the next, the course of the next nine, 10 years to double. It's supposed there's a projection of about $6.2 trillion in healthcare spending. It's an ever increasing issue. It impacts everybody in our society. Uh, it's gonna impact, it impacts our generations, the older generations and the, uh, the future generations. So it's extremely important. In Ohio alone, based on their previous four years of budget, they are over $20 billion in spending just on healthcare. So it's clearly an issue that's important because it affects people's lives, but it's also very costly. So how do we, how do we balance the cost and the value? That's, that's a difficult question. <clears throat> also, why is it important to understand managed care, right? It's important because it accounts for about 70% of all Medicaid delivery in the United States. So it, across the United States, most states have Medicaid enrollees that are serviced under a managed care organization. Um, and that number, I believe, continues to increase. That, those are statistics from 19, or 2018. But it's basically the primary model for Medicaid spending and Medicaid administration. So it's the prevalent model and, and, and it's at the forefront of this country's healthcare system. Next, and, and also important, is this is a big business industry as well. Um, if, as you can see up there, I put some statistics, but basically the six largest health insurance companies account for almost 50% of all Medicaid enrollment across the entire country. That's Medicaid enrollment too. These insurers that you, you see on the screen, I'm sure you've heard of them, whether you have a private health insurance plan or those that are on Medicaid, they're touching your medical care in some way. Um, and they're all publicly traded companies uh, and they're Fortune 500 companies. They have a lot of influence, right? but they're at the front lines of providing this managed care, not just privately, but through Medicaid and to the Medicaid population. So there's massive influence and there's massive publicity um, impacts as well to this, but it's ever more important, right? All right, so let's talk about how it works, right? So you know, we describe what managed care is, we describe why it's important, and now we're gonna talk a little bit about how it works. So first, Medicaid is a structured partnership between the federal government and the states, the individual states. There's a lot of flexibility in designing Medicaid programs. Um, so I'm gonna stay fairly general with this, but basically the federal shares payments with the state. States pay managed care organizations basically a fixed, um, a fixed payment amount for a defined benefit plan. So these payments are made per member per month. These are fixed payments. So this is where the state has capped their costs and now they've transitioned this to MCOs who now assume the full risk and accountability for caring for these members. The state's happy because they're, they've got budget predictability now, but now it's on the MCO to ensure that whatever amount they get per month, you know, say, say, it's, 10, say it's $100 a month, if, if 
their, if that member's care costs over $100 a month, then it's the MCO who's responsible for that payment. If it's under, then we help provide value to the state and our members. But the MCO here bears the risk and uh, in these comprehensive risk contract programs. And they vary, of course, throughout, throughout the country, throughout states, um, but that's generally how it works. There's also lots of regulations, federal and obviously state law and, and contractual provisions around the rates that are paid to MCOs. It's based on a lot of factors. Um, they must be, one of the important parts of this is federal regulations state that the rates have to be actuarially sound. Um, so basically, um, and the payments that are taken in from the state have to be enough to cover the cost of the health care, but there's other, um, there's other limitations that are built in within contracts that have to be met, such as um, availability of services to members, network adequacy, um, conditions of continuity of care, and then also medical loss ratio, which is basically maintaining a 85%, you can, it's an 85% give or take medical loss ratio where you can spend up to 85% of the funds, but if you spend either too much or too little, it gets adjusted and, and recouped in different ways. So that's, that's kind of the basis how payment works. So I, I wanna talk now about kind of like the logistics uh, we talked about the payment. So you get a capitated payment as an MCO to take care of a member. How does this work? How do you make this work? That's a challenge, right? It's challenging. There's a lot of issues. So there's a lot that goes into this, but I'm going to focus on really kind of three, three foundational pillars here that are essential. Oftentimes, I think of... MCOs and Medicaid government programs as, as stewards of the taxpayer dollar, right? We are contracted with a state, a company and MCOs contracted with a state, taking state and taxpayer dollars funds to administer a health program. So there's this fiduciary sort of responsibility we have, but there's also the responsibility to the members to provide adequate, necessary health care. So how do you do this practically? The first one, and, and one of the predominant features of an MCO, is appropriate utilization management. That's the front lines. Does anyone know what utilization management is? Because I didn't when I started. Yes? Learning whether the patient is requesting care in the medically necessary and... Correct. Excellent answer. I'll have to repeat that one. But yes, when I, when I first started in this, uh, this area of law, I had no idea what that was. And I gradually learned over time. But utilization management is one of the key foundational principles. It's the evaluation of medical necessity, appropriateness, and efficiency of the use of services in the defined health plan that the state provides. So these are also, you'll hear, you'll hear the term you know, prior authorizations a lot. I'm sure at some point someone has gotten here, may have gotten medical services that needed prior authorization. This is the first frontline gateway, right? This is so critical because, in fact, it's so critical that the first sentence in the Ohio Administrative Code under medical or under under their Medicaid program is is section 5160-1-01. And it says, medical necessity is a fundamental concept underlying the medical program. So what does this mean, right? If services aren't necessary, you're wasting money, and you know, the patient, you're wasting time, and the patient doesn't really need it. But medical necessity is the foundational <laughs> principle of all of this. And the front lines is the utilization management department. If, if you, those are typically staffed with licensed, they, they are staffed with medical professionals, licensed medical professionals who evaluate cases, clinical documentation that's been supported and given when a member requests services. 
and they assess this documentation against policies, procedures, and um, met the medical necessity criteria established by both Ohio Administrative Code and also generally accepted medical principles. So, if, if utilization management serves as the gateway, if everything that comes in that's requested by a patient comes right through, there's nothing stopping that and nothing's being controlled. Man costs begin to rise, nothing's really truly managed. So that's why utilization management is probably the, the, one of the most important pillars of an MCO program in Medicaid. Next, there's this, uh, you know, as, as you're a steward of state funds, you're also protecting members' health. So how do you balance when somebody wants medical services, gets a prior authorization request, against the member who's requesting those services? It can be a delicate balance, but there needs to be a check and balance. You can't have one you know, party or person determining what's medically relevant or not to deny procedures or not. So there's member protections and there's plenty of them in place. The, the two most important one, the department that handles that typically is called the grievance and appeals department. So, so essentially, if somebody's denied a service or prior authorization is denied, that's the first, it's called a, a notice of an adverse determination. That's the first kind of step. You've been notified that you are not able to do the, have these medical services. If somebody doesn't agree with that, they have the right, pursuant to law, to file an internal appeal. What happens on these internal appeals is it goes to medical doctors who review the case, who review the criteria, and they determine whether or not it was truly medically necessary, or the documentation was lacking, or it was sufficient. If a medical doctor on internal appeal denies, they have an external outlet, and these are called state fair hearings. So this is when a member is denied internally by an MCO, but they have the option and the right to appeal to the state. Typically these are administrative law judge proceedings, and what happens in these proceedings is the member and possibly their provider, and sometimes providers acting on behalf of members, come to the administrative law judge. Somebody, a representative from the MCO, comes to the administrative law judge, and the member provides their reasons, their documentation supporting the reasons why they believe the denial should be overturned. The MCOs, on the other hand, come with their providers or medical doctors. They present testimony and say, the MCO followed appropriate procedures, policy, and the medical necessity rules. And we present the case, and the judge ultimately determines. But either way, there's checks and balances for all these sort of things. Um, and that's extremely critical when you're dealing with medical conditions and people's lives, right, with also excessive or unnecessary spending. I think a big misconception sometimes people will have is, you know, people will say, you know, health, health insurance denies people coverage, especially like in the Medicaid sector. And, th and that's not necessarily true. Um, Ohio administrative code and laws spell out particular benefits that need to be, uh, that are defined for, for members. And um, if they don't meet certain criteria, that coverage is, 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 is not provided. On the contrary, if something truly is medically necessary, somebody will get coverage. An example, for instance, could be somebody who's requesting um, a $10,000 wheelchair. They don't maybe need the $10,000 wheelchair when the $2,000 wheelchair may suffice just fine. That extra $8,000, you know, that's state money, that's taxpayer money. And that's what medical necessity prevents against. The last kind of component that's important here is, is what we call program integrity. And that's really about ensuring proper distribution of funds um, and managing the Medicaid dollars and spending appropriately to ensure quality and efficient care with minimal waste. Um, it, the program integrity unit sort of functions in a couple of different ways. 
Um, but primarily they work to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. So, f and fraud, fraud is, does, any, does anyone here know what fraud is from, I forgot my old tort days and whatnot. Anyone here give me a definition? Somebody. You've got a torts professor, right? Okay. Fraud, it, fraud's an intentionally, uh, an act that intentionally is trying to falsify something. So if, if a provider falsifies a claim and submits a claim for somebody that they didn't see, that would be fraud. Um, waste is, in an, is defined as an inappropriate use of services. And abuse is defined as an action inconsistent with acceptable medical practice and, and business um, principles. So for instance, like a doctor may schedule multiple unnecessary, maybe office visits. That would be sort of an example of, of an abuse um, rather than fraud. Or, and this is both provider and member focused too. A member may try to take advantage of the Medicaid system as well. So. Fraud, waste, and abuse, and program integrity are monitored on both sides because ultimately these are state funds. So a, provider, a member may want to go make multiple um, doctor visits to get different prescriptions or mul fill multiple prescriptions, perhaps opioids or narco narcotics in some cases. These are all examples that need to be protected against. These are sort of the back end examples compared to the front end clinical examples. The other, um, the other item, the other important thing is in program integrity, there's claims, right? So you can't imagine how many claims from thousands, millions of members in Ohio, there's you know, you know, over, over almost three million members. You can't imagine how many claims are coming in on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So you're getting claims that come in. You need to adequately identify those claims authorize them appropriately, and then process them and pay them. This is a big task, it's a big undertaking. Um, but, and there's a lot of laws and regulations that govern timeframes for payment, um, clean claims, claims that are, meaning clean claims, meaning whether they're deficient on their face or whether they have to be returned to a provider. Um, there's also mechanisms for recovery of overpayments of funds. Again, these are state funds. Some of these are federal funds. If, if funds are given when they're not appropriate, we need to recover them as, as MCOs. So essentially, these are kind of the three massive sort of pillars of, of how this functions. And as you can see, they're all in such delicate balance. You know, nothing in life is perfect. You know, nothing. So, Managing funds and spending and people's health care, it's a very delicate balance. And if one, one pillar, one thing is off, something suffers, whether it be quality of care, whether it be um, more spending. But when people's health, is when, when the pillars are functioning correctly, it operates in a system that is, is, is in my opinion, superior to you know, fee-for-service. And when people's health is appropriately managed, people are typically healthier, and healthy people don't need as many medical resources. So you're, you're contributing to this, this better overall health goal, both from a spending perspective and from a personal perspective. But it's all very delicate, right? And something must give, and oftentimes a lot of things give, and that's part of this whole discussion of uh, healthcare in our society today. So that was kind of the, pr the, the brief rundown of how MCOs work, what's important, why they're important, what things are at stake, what things need to be balanced. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the future landscape of healthcare and, and how this influences healthcare. Um, and one of the things, MC and this is part of the holistic approach, but one of the things that MCOs do in part of their program plans is identify and address these things called social determinants of health. So as we move forward, and even now, right, companies have to look at people as people, 
right? They have to address the person and the situation, not just the individual illness. And one way of doing this is addressing social determinants of health. Um, what, what that means, examples, for instance, are, are kind of all, all things that, um, all factors that combine to either pre cause a barrier to access for health care. Um, examples are, you know, resources to meet daily needs, housing, food, transportation. If somebody's sick and they don't have their own car, how are they going to get to the doctor? If they're, they're unhealthy and they're deteriorating, how are they eating appropriate food and nutrition? You know, these things generally are hard enough for anybody in life, but when someone has a difficult medical condition they're trying to manage, all these factors combine to crush, they really can crush somebody. So we can't just focus on that individual who has a single health condition, treat it, and send them on their way. No, it needs to be more managed than that. It needs to be more holistic than that. And that's what MCOs and managed care plans do. They address the whole issue and try. Because, and, and not, I mean, it's out of the goodness of their heart. Sometimes a lot of the people work in there, right? But it's also financially incentivized to do that. If you can prevent massive health care problems in an individual by addressing some of these social determinants of health, then you can possibly prevent more serious medical conditions, hospital stays, other things that are extremely more costly than, you know, providing, um, providing transportation to a doctor's appointment. So these barriers need to be addressed, and, and these are things that um, MCOs help with. The other thing, I know it's timely. Certainly, we're all wearing masks here, except for me. I feel like the lucky one right now. Um, is COVID, right? COVID has changed our society. It's changed how we function. Um, but specifically in healthcare, we have seen a shift in telehealth services. We've also seen a shift in mental health, behavioral health services. Something, mental health is, is not something that's always talked about. It's not as easily comprehended either. It's when someone has a mental health condition, it's not like they have, you know, a broken arm where everybody can see it and they know they're going to heal. When they have a mental health condition, nobody can see it and they suffer. And COVID has helped facilitate that suffering in so many people. But a good thing that's come out of this has been the increase in telehealth and access to care for people who maybe didn't, couldn't go out, didn't want to go out, now they can get up on their computer or they can go look at their phone and they can get treatment and care. And, and that's a great thing that's come out of this. And moving forward, look for telehealth to, to really continue um, helping many people, not just private individuals, private insurance, but in the Medicaid sector. So I, I know we're running a little short on time here. Um, so I, I wanted, I wanted, to, I, I hope this helped give you um, a little bit of overview about managed care, what MCOs do, and um, a little insight into the healthcare system. And I also wanted to give a piece of advice because I'm speaking to to students here. Um, you know, if you learn nothing else from from what I've said today. Some of you might not be interested in healthcare, some of you are. Um, but remember this, you know, as you move forward in your careers, do something that you are passionate about doing. Something that you wake up to and drives you. Something that motivates you. A lot of times, jobs will turn into jobs, they'll become mundane, right? But do something that motivates you, that you wake up in the morning and do, because your time, not money, is the most valuable resource you have. So spend it wisely. Anyway, I will open it up to some questions, if that's OK. Thank you very much. So if you are uh, watching remotely, you can uh, ask a question in the Q&A. Uh, and I will uh, relay them to, uh, uh, to uh, Mr. Daniele. And also, uh, people here, um, we have a microphone you need to use. If there are any questions, please raise your hand. And we'll pass you a microphone. Do we have one? Oh, go ahead. 
Hi, uh, my name is Tom. Uh, you were talking a little bit about social determinants of health and barriers to access. Can you talk a little bit about the ways in which MCOs limit out-of-network care uh, and how we can kind of support patients in getting the doctors that they need? Hmm. That's, a, that's a good question, and some of that's a little bit of a misconception, right? So out-of-network care. I'm assuming, and this is actually very pertinent because federal law just passed, or not just passed, but recently they passed the No Surprise Act, right? So this is, a, this is directed at protecting patients from surprise billing. So how this works, typically, you know, in the, in the HMO, Medicaid sector, if you're in network, you're covered by many different providers with many different specialties. Some of the network adequacy requirements mandate that members have access to particular doctors and services. So at the very minimum, somebody shouldn't necessarily need to get out of network care. Where this, where this really pops up the most is out of network care in emergency services settings. Um, and I know this gets into both, you know, this draws the line between Medicaid and then marketplace, so I can sort of address both, but you know, in an emergency setting situation, no matter what insurance coverage you have, you are covered, you are, if, if it's truly an emergency, you go to any hospital, it doesn't matter if it's in network or out of network, and you're covered. Now what the No Surprises Act has done has allowed patients that have gone to out of network um, doctors or facilities either in an ER setting or in kind of an unanticipated emergency care setting to not then subsequently be billed by out of network providers that stick them with the bills. That's a protection that's recently come into place and it's going to be implemented over the coming years and, and it's a good protection. I think, I'm not sure if that exactly addresses your question, but this, this worry about out of network, it's certainly a worry for people that need to come up with funds to pay for that, but in, in truly surprise billing settings, that's not an issue for a patient moving forward. And typically, MCOs will have the adequate network in place to be able to facilitate that access to care in the first place. So there shouldn't be out of network care in most cases. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I mean, I'm happy to clarify. I'm Olivia. Um, so you spoke kind of at depth about how MCOs um, work alongside trying to make healthcare more affordable. Um, yet there isn't, like, I guess from looking at government data, it seems that MCOs are considered to be like a 10% overhead um, on government healthcare or government funded healthcare. And then in addition, you have hospital systems that are paying individuals to work with insurance companies, MCOs, um, to make sure that the, that the like, actual care is covered. So there's additional costs that are beyond just like the overhead of paying a company to do this job that the government isn't able to do at the moment. So I guess when, when it seems like you're contributing to the rise in cost of healthcare, how, I guess, are they like working to combat that? Um, or like, yeah, I guess mostly like, it feels like MCOs are attributing to the rising cost of healthcare versus actually causing it to be more affordable for the patient. So, so I think you touched on a 10% sort of figure that you might be first referencing sort of this medical loss ratio sort of thing. So there's administrative costs that go in to um, running a program, paying for staff, for instance, paying for the, the doctors that review cases. So there's some built-in administrative cost that's associated with that generally. How it caps, first, it caps state taxpayer dollars, number one. Now we're talking in a Medicaid context. Now there's other private insurance, I mean these are separate sort of, I mean they're, they're interrelated but they're also separate. In a Medicaid context, you're capped and the, the networks that are established by providers and the insurance companies 
have these built-in sort of efficacies in them where they're getting paid a certain amount of money and that's based on value, that's based on quality. If you just ha if you open the door to every provider to uh, be allowed to just bill whatever they want to charge, that would inflate costs as well. So by having a, a, a limited sort of network that knows what the costs are to provide a certain service, the costs don't spiral out of control. Unnecessary tests aren't utilized. And that's kind of the point, that's what the, the problem was with fee-for-service in, in a lot of ways, and, and how MCOs help curtail that in a way. Yeah, I guess I just, I've looked through research because I used to work in healthcare IT, and like there isn't direct evidence that MCOs are more affordable or more effective than fee-for-service. So I guess I'm just like trying to figure out like what actual, where that more affordable aspect is coming from. Yeah, um, I, whether, whether there is evidence out there that shows fee-for-service is somehow more um, effective, um, you know, perhaps that's debatable, but being able to confine your costs to utilize structures in place to manage those costs is, is a lot more efficient. It's, it's a better mechanism of control over costs generally. Otherwise, the states may be, if, if you, you don't know how to plan for it as a state, if you're a legislator and you're sitting there and say, how much is my medical care going to cost? Well, if, it, if there's no capped amount on that, how are you going to plan? Right? And then that, plan, that gets passed on to the taxpayer dollars. So then now we're all paying for medical care that we don't, we don't even know what it's going to cost, but it's capped. And in that sense, it, it, it provides a better sort of structure. It Question over here. Hi, my name is Kathy. And I, I'm a little confused because you would say often that you are working with the state or federal government's money. But as I understood you to say, the MCO is paid a per member per month or whatever it is, fee, no matter what the costs actually are. So how are you, isn't, you're just working with the money, the MCO is working with the money that's been paid to it through a per member per month fee structure. Correct. So you're no longer working with the federal government's money. I mean, you're working with your own money, the fees that have been paid to the MCO. So it seems to me there's an incentive to reduce the costs as much as you can because the more you can reduce the cost, the more your profit is. Cor correct, and, and that's, that's certainly a factor in this. So it, it, it's still all state funds, and there's regulations, and there's something called medical loss ratio. So to give you an example, all the funds that come from you know, federal and state funding, you know, say they get put in a pot, right? And this is what you have to use the entire year. If those funds aren't adequate, if there's a lot of medical services to care for members, and it goes above that you know, $100 a year, then the insurance company has to absorb that cost. That's part of the risk-based contract. If it's under, then there's a certain gap, I think it's about 10%, 8 to 10%, that can be taken out for administrative costs, such as, you know, paying for people's salaries to administer the program. But it's, that's at a certain amount. If, if, um, if there's an excess amount used f or not used, then that goes back to the state. So there's, there's a kind of a, a cap in place. There's a, uh, a barrier that protects against just profit, pure profitability for the sake of profitability when it comes to government spending. Now, private insurance can operate under different structures, of course. Uh, I have one question, and I didn't see any other hands, and I'd like to see. Um, so, um, as uh, uh, Vince was sort of referring to, in most cases, Medicaid spending uh, by the federal government and the states is not capped. Um, uh, if people consume more care in a managed care plan, uh, in a Medicaid plan, uh, then the state pays them more, uh, pay, uh, 
has to come up with more money, and the federal government has, you know, chips in to its to share um, from a state perspective. So, you know, the rates are negotiated higher and higher because prices are rising, consumption is increasing, uh, more money is put in. There is an alternative approach called the block grants um, to states. And I'm wondering, so what that means is that uh, all the, the federal government would simply give the state of Ohio a fixed amount per, you know, per fiscal year, and if the state spent more than that, um, it would have, it wouldn't get any help from the feds in doing so. How do you anticipate that uh, affecting uh, your operations? Well, you know, we, we have a lot, a lot of it is, a lot of it is data driven, right? We have historical data trends and, and healthcare claims and, and a lot of things within our data systems that help give us predictability, right? These are, these are factors and variables that are input and data has so much to do with the way we predict our healthcare costs, manage our healthcare costs. Um, so, you know, moving forward, you know, there are, there are times and scenarios where something doesn't go as predicted and you know states and the federal government of course will help come to aid look at look at coronavirus and what happened look at all the relief that has happened and being given to hospitals and healthcare providers etc so there is wiggle room like you like you just um, enumerated um, did, did that answer your question so i guess my question is how would block grants change your business model <coughs> You know, that's, that's a good question. I can't, from a business perspective, I think, I think you take it as it comes, and you tr but your business plan shouldn't take into account potential grants that are given. You know, you should, you should operate within the confines and constraints of the budget that's projected based on analytical data, not necessarily possible funds that may come in the future. Thank you.